Hello everybody. I hope you're all keeping well and managing through these times while visiting is restricted. To help pass a bit of time for you, I'm going to read from Alice Taylor's To School Through the Fields. I hope you enjoy it. I hope it brings back some memories and gives you some things to chat about. This is the story of a childhood. In its day, it was an ordinary childhood, but with the changing winds of time, now it could never be. Ours was a large family in a close-knit rural community that was an extension of our home. Neighbours came to our house and we went to theirs as freely as the birds flew across the sky. Invitations were unheard of and welcomes unquestioned. The old were never alone as the neighbours joined hands around them and the young too were included in the circle. As in every group of individuals, all had their own idiosyncrasies and we as children were educated in human awareness by the close association with many people. Sharing was taken for granted, from the milk in the winter when some cows went dry, to the pork steak and puddings when the pig was killed. Work was also shared, from the saving of the hay to the cutting of the corn and preparing for the stations. It was an interlaced community and its structure helped those within it to support each other. So please come back with me to where we had time to be children and life moved at a different pace. Chapter One, A Child's Nest. Lishnashoiga was the nest from which we learned to fly. An ivy-clad farmhouse surrounded by trees, it stood on the sunny side of a sloping hill at the foot of which the Darragal River curved its way through gold furred inches to disappear under a stone bridge into the woods beyond. In the summers, we swam in the river and caught minnows with jam pots. On Sunday evenings, my father fished in it, each time bringing home a bag of trout. In winter, salmon came up to this quiet backwater to spawn and of course there was a certain amount of poaching, to which my father objected strongly. Once, when a generous neighbour gave us a present of a poached salmon, he lined us all up around the kitchen table and proceeded to open up the fish. As the eggs poured out, he explained about the huge loss of fish life due to the poaching of this one salmon. In my father's world, nature possessed a balance, and man had no right to upset that balance to satisfy his own greed. Killing this fish was going against the laws of nature. The river showed us two different faces of nature. In summer it was our friend, but in winter it burst into brown torrents of anger that overflowed its banks and swept down our valley with a menacing roar. From the river valley the land rose and stretched away into rolling countryside, climbing into misty mountains at the horizon. This was farming country, where the farmers and nature changed the face of the landscape with the seasons. Our parents were a blend of opposites. My mother was kind and gentle with a far-seeing wisdom and she expected only the best from her fellow human beings. My father was a man with a high level of intelligence and a low threshold of tolerance. Patience was not one of his virtues. He loved trees, birds and all his farm animals. Nature he appreciated to the full, but he viewed his fellow human beings with a jaundiced eye and never expected too much from them. With seven children in the family, we were reared as free as birds, growing up in a world of simplicity untouched by outside influences. Our farm was our world, and nature as an educator gave free rein to our imaginations. Unconsciously, we absorbed the natural order of things and observed the facts of life unfolding daily before our eyes. We were free to be children and to grow up at our own pace in a quiet place close to the earth. Chapter 2. Preparing for the Stations in our townland, our turn for the stations came round every six years, and then it was like three Christmases rolled into one. The preparations might start as much as 12 months in advance, as that provided an opportunity to get everything done that needed to be done in the house. The reason, of course, for this big clean-up was that mass was going to be said in the house, and all the neighbours for miles around were going to descend on us. Broken walls in the yard were repaired, and any gate pillar that had lost its balance suddenly found itself standing erect. Gates that had sagged previously now swung with free abandon. Loose sheets of galvanised were nailed down and missing slates replaced. Muddy grey walls became virgin white overnight and dung hills disappeared out of sight. The cows could be forgiven for thinking that they were in a strange farmyard and we almost expected them not to do what they always did. The outside clean-up was insignificant compared to what went on inside. Nothing from the roof down was safe. Mice and spiders that had nested comfortably for months suddenly found themselves in need of boating facilities as soapy water gushed around them. 
Broken panes of glass that had been patched up with bits of timber were replaced. Sometimes a whole new window was installed. Bags of rubbish were burned indiscriminately and many a family treasure was reduced to ashes. Rooms that were full of clutter before now doubled in size. We wandered around in a house full of hollow sounds. When the burning and washing was finished, the painting began and nothing escaped the paintbrush. Ceilings, walls, tables and chairs all took on a new bright look. It was the era of the slow drying paint and if you forgot to watch your step, you could end up with a multicoloured look yourself. The stations only affected the downstairs rooms fully, but if a nosy visitor strayed off the main thoroughfare, we were not going to be caught with our pants down. Cleaning and painting finished, the next target was the big ware press in the parlour. Out came delicate china which had been in the family for years. My mother's respect for the stations weighed against her fear of breakage, but the stations won every time. Once, when a precious jug was broken, she mourned it for days, telling us all how long it had been in the family. Finally, Dan, our part-time travelling farm worker, said, Mrs, if it was here that long, it was time to break it. And that was the end of that. On the day before the stations, everything started to come together. The house was full of women polishing and setting tables. White linen tablecloths saw the light of day for the first time in years, and mothballs rolled from between their creases. A strict eye was kept on the children, and for good reason. One year, on the day before a neighbour's stations, all the good furniture was out in the yard while a new floor was being laid. The adults were busy in the house while the children, discovering a bucket of whitewash, proceeded to paint the dark mahogany furniture a brilliant white. Such potential catastrophes had to be borne in mind. The night before the stations had a special atmosphere filled with a sense of expectancy. The whole house lay in readiness, with fires set in all the downstairs rooms. Tables were laid with fine china and shining silver, while bowls of lump sugar and dishes of butter rolls lay covered in the kitchen. In front of the fire was a row of polished shoes, graduating from tiny tots upwards. We were all bathed in a big timber tub in front of the bedroom fire, and we young ones were the last to be washed because our chances of getting dirty again were the greatest. I doubt that my mother went to bed at all that night, and if she did, it was for a very short period. The cows got an early awakening in the morning, and the milk was carried out to the creamery bright and early. Dirty jobs finished, everyone put on their finery. The large kitchen table was raised with a chair under each end to act as the altar. My mother was very particular about the altar. As for her, this was what it was all about. She was a deeply religious person and the honour of having mass set in her house was something which she appreciated to the full. On the morning of the stations, she had about her a special aura of peace. All the fuss of preparation was over and now, surrounded by her family and friends, because all her neighbours were her friends, she was going to welcome the Lord into her home. They were the two most important things in her life, her family and her God. My father, dressed in his black suit and shining soft boots, he never wore shoes, waited outside the door to welcome his neighbours and the priests when they came. It was grand to see the neighbours arriving, some having worked late with us the night before, but now all dressed up for the occasion. Finally, the priests arrived to a flurry of handshakes all around. One priest said mass in the kitchen, while the other heard confessions by the fire in the parlour. It always tickled my fancy going to confession by our own parlour fire. There was a warm feeling about this mass and communion, with all the neighbours gathered round the kitchen table. We had worked and played together, and now we were sharing something much greater, which formed a bond between us. It was like the Last Supper. After Mass, the confession priest joined the other and dues were collected. A volunteer was sought for the next station, which posed no problem as every house took its turn and everybody knew who was next. Then the flurry started, feeding the multitudes, but instead of loaves and fishes, there was usually an abundance of goodies. Everybody helped, so there was no panic, only organised confusion, and all were fed in the end. When breakfast was over, the priests left and that was the official end of the stations but in reality it carried on all day and far into the night. Neighbours who could not come in the morning and maybe were not in our station area came in the evening or even that night. Relations of varying degrees turned up and as ours was a long-tailed family, this meant half the parish. As well as a religious event, it was also a social occasion. People came together who normally only worked together and visitors met old neighbours. Great talking was done. An impromptu concert often started up and anybody who could sing and indeed some who could not, entertained the light-hearted gathering. 
This evolved into a dance with a neighbour providing music on a melodeon. There was no shortage of energy and you would think that we had been resting up for a week beforehand. After the stations, nothing could be found for weeks. Caps had disappeared and Wellingtons were reported missing and many a man was left without his favourite old jacket. But who cared? We had had a great day and the house was fit to receive visitors from America for months afterwards. I hope you enjoyed that. We'll have the next couple of chapters up tomorrow. Slod.